Excellent. Well, yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. Well, uh, uh, good afternoon and, uh, or good morning, good evening to many of you. Uh, welcome to our state of the industry. Uh, this is our sort of engineering and technology uh, panel conversation. So over the next hour, it's our hope that uh, we'll be able to share some optimism, some practical insights, and some best practices um, to help all of us navigate our career in the short and the long term. Uh, my name is Matt Casey. I am the Associate Director of Graduate Career Services, um, and I'm thrilled to introduce our three panelists today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Suden Feint, uh, who's the Fellow and Manager of Analog Devices uh, Advanced Process Development Group. Uh, Analog Devices is a world leader in the design, manufacture, and marketing of a broad portfolio of high-performance analog, mixed signal, and digital signal processing integrated circuits used in virtually all types of electronic equipment. Um, and I imagine Susan will be able to, to elaborate on uh, many of those details, uh, which I'm excited about. Uh, the second we have uh, joining us is Lewis Ellis, who is an accomplished software engineer and the founder of Ellis & Ellis Consulting Group, which is a, a company that uh, focuses and specializes on software and project management consulting. Um, that current venture helps businesses build software, launch new products, measure the results, and learn the marketplace. Uh, we're thrilled to have you, Alice, uh, Lewis. And lastly, we have uh, uh, Mira uh, Lehman Sifri, uh, who's a civil engineer, civil engineering consultant with NV5 and a, a leading provider of professional and technical engineering and consulting solutions. Um, again, we're thrilled to have you uh, sharing your time today. So to begin with, um, we're hoping to ask uh, each of our panelists a specific question, and then uh, once we complete that, uh, we'll move on to more of an open dialogue. So the first question is for you, Susan. And I was wondering, can you describe the distinction of your role as a fellow at Analog, um, and a little bit about the scope of that role, and how has that role developed over time? Um, sure, thank you. It's nice to be here today. Um, well, I started in engineering and um, I do process development and I still do that. I manage process development now for semiconductor or integrated circuits. I'm not sure how many of you know what, what the details of that, but I'm not going to go into it. Um, but I moved up as I, I, I like being, having a broad view of things. And as I've moved up technically, that's why it was in recognition of my technical contributions that um, I was made a fellow at analog devices. And that's a distinction that's, or, or, or honor that's bestowed based on your peers, other fellows um, in the organization. But once I had that, I continued in my role as a, a manager of, of process development initiatives, but then I got to also do broader roles. Like I just chaired a technical conference for the company. I'm on the technology advisory council for the company, a technology leadership council for the company, and also extending that beyond to be an ambassador for analog devices. And I represent um, you know, on a lot of boards for um, like at MIT, the Nano Center there and the Microtechnology Center. So I like that I still get to contribute technically by leading projects, but get to see a broad view of, of all the initiatives that are going on at analog devices. So I, I feel like it's, um, you know, I'm lucky to have that position and I, I you know, I'm happy to be um, representing analog here. And so is that a follow up to that question? Uh, you've uh, you've been with Analog for for some time, and I was curious, what is it about the organization, your experience, that's kept you there and interested in the work you've done, rather than um, maybe moving on to somewhere else? Well, it continues to be challenging. There's always a new problem to be solved. Um, Analog has a lot of smart people, and so working with such highly skilled, qualified, and Generally nice people, that's the best part about analog. Um, I came to analog, I worked at Harris Semiconductor before analog, and I liked it analog that you could almost take on as much as you wanted. Um, you could look at a, a, have a broad view of projects, and so not just um, specializing in one given area. We do a, a lot of different things. We not only make integrated circuits, we have optical, you know, from electronic perspective, we have optical, me mechanical, MEM structures, um, we have design, we have product engineering. There's so many different opportunities at analog devices. And 
you may or may not know, but we continue to grow. We recently acquired Linear Tech and we just announced that we're acquiring Maxim. So <laughs> the company just keeps bringing on more opportunities and challenges and, and that's what I like about it. Can I just interject the part of the reason that Susan's on this panel is I, I worked at Analog a long time ago, but she was also the first female fellow at the company, which is a really, really big deal. That's all I'll say. Thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, Lewis, this next question is for you. Uh, hey, everyone. Yeah, welcome. Uh, so, you know, I understand from the first five plus years of your career, um, you worked in a variety, for a variety of companies in software engineering roles, um, including the, I think the Volpe Setter, TripAdvisor, uh, I saw Rula La. So I was curious, you know, what was the catalyst for your transition to entrepreneurship? Um, and what, what did you derive from your, your former experiences, professional experiences, and how did they sort of illuminate and prepare you to run your own show? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I, um, so I, I worked on a variety of, of different teams, different technologies and uh, things over the years, but um, I wanted to, um, I guess, help other companies solve, solve bigger, I guess, bigger problems. Um, like one thing software engineering is it kind of gets repetitive. Like I, I worked on, um, like at TripAdvisor, I worked on the website um, you work on features that, you know, seen by millions of people, um, but not often, especially when you're working for a bigger company, you get to like um, have, a, I guess, a large impact on the company. Like it's, you get to work on, I guess, a small piece of the pie. Um, so as I like move from company to company, I kind of saw that was um, kind of the theme of things. Like, unless you're like working for a startup, um, you're kind of, not really making a large impact. So I um, always had the idea, like I minored in entrepreneurship when I was at Tufts, always had the idea that I wanted to uh, I start my own business at some point. And once I felt like I had enough experience, I just like kind of just jump out and did it. Um, my, uh, so my, my family, like I'm from, um, I guess entrepreneurs, my, uh, my mom has a home healthcare business and my, um, my grandmother uh, back in Jamaica, like she, um, she had like a store um, or in the countryside of Jamaica. So it's like, I guess something that kind of came naturally to like eventually evolve, like once, once I had that experience, like comfort level. Um, but uh, I guess looking back, there's nothing that can really prepare you <laughs> to just like jump out and do it. Like it's just kind of just take it day by day and, uh, you know, just, you know, learn. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Do you still, how much of your time is spent as an engineer and how much of your time is spent as an entrepreneur and founder and leader? Um, so I code, uh, I, I code probably, I guess, 60% of the time. I, um, there's, a, there's a skill that I uh, kind of, um, I wasn't good, I, I was never a good writer. And um, it's kind of one of the reasons, I guess, I also became an engineer. I was never a good writer, never good at languages and um, things like that. So I thought, um, I guess I went into engineering to kind of get away from that. But I realized that's like most of my day, like writing copy, um, like actually building a website um, and uh, effectively communicating like what I can bring to the table. Um, so it's... Yeah, it, it's 60% uh, on, on, I guess, on like a good day. Um, sometimes uh, it depends on like job to job. Um, for like contracts uh, with companies that are like established, like I've worked with um, uh, companies like Hopper where they, um, they're also in the travel space um, where they kind of already have things, like everything's already in motion. Like they just need some assistance, um, like more engineering assistance. Um, more like manpower. So in those cases, it's basically like 80% coding and, and, and doing the usual, like uh, working with product managers and, and those things. Um, but it's uh, usually it's, it's more of a mixture of, um, I guess, consulting, saying what, 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 what I think is best to, to do next, and then a mixture of uh, actual coding implementation. 
Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Amir, this is for you. So, you know, you have a, uh, a, you know, a background and, you know, sort of focused on symbol engineering, but you, you know, you also have a graduate degree in sustainability. And what I thought was interesting is you also uh, took on an active membership role with the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association. And what I was curious about is how have you decided to take on a, a, let's say maybe a volunteer role and how have you balanced your time between your professional responsibilities and working in your capacity with uh, the Sustainable Energy Association? Uh, luckily, I was hired to a company that really values having outside interests. Um, my, uh, well, when I first started at NV5, we were this small kind of mom and pop, not so small, they were about 200 people, but it was still very mom and pop-ish feeling. Um, very uh, friendly environment. Most of the people had been there since they had graduated um, and were there 10, 12 years at that point when I started. Um, and one of the things that I really liked was that a lot of the people I was working with had projects and had interests outside of what we were doing in the office. Um, and so there was a lot of opportunity for me to kind of step away from the very civil design uh, side of things and step more into areas that I have interest in outside of what my day-to-day -day job is. So uh, NESI, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, was uh, a nonprofit that I got involved in while I was at Tufts. They run a huge conference up in Boston. Um, this year it's virtual, um, otherwise I'd be up in Boston to go to it. Um, but I actually just applied to be on the board and was recommended by somebody who I've known for a handful of years through NESI to apply for the board, which as a 30 year old applying for the board of a, a large uh, nonprofit is uh, a good experience and also something that I, I feel very unqualified for, but it was, it was kind of uh, humbling for one of the board members who I've reached out to for networking advice, all that. He reached out to me and said, hey, we'd love to see an application from you. Um, so I guess to answer your question, uh, NV5 really honors and respects people having interest outside of the work that we do in our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, and that was definitely something that drew me to being with that company. I've now been there almost six and a half years. Um, so to say I graduated and I started right away at a company that I'm still at and that they've supported me doing a master's degree in something that's not directly related to my day-to-day -day work um, was kind of a, a really nice thing for my boss, my peers, everybody to support me in that, um, knowing that maybe I'd bring back small tidbits of information um, in terms of creating more sustainable projects within our civil infrastructure realm. Oh, that's brilliant. And congratulations on- uh, Thank you. That's really, really fantastic. This, uh, yeah. this dovetails in this is for all of you, and I think this is a question that came from uh, one of our students is, how much of your academic background did you apply to your current career? Um, was, it, was it direct or is it something you developed over time? Actually, very little direct. I majored in chemical engineering and I ended up in the semiconductor industry. I've learned a lot since I've been there, but the one thing that I use every day that I, I acquired in school is my problem solving skills my confidence that I can approach and solve even the most difficult problems, um, working together as a team. Um, these are a lot of uh, maybe softer skills, but they're very valuable. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of those points. Um, if anything, the company that hired me, they're a transportation infrastructure firm and Tufts, at least while I was there, didn't have very many transportation classes at all. Um, so they hired me knowing I had the problem solving, the personability, the uh, ability to write my thoughts to explain what I was trying to, to do in a design. Um, and they kind of groomed me into the kind of civil infrastructure engineer that I am today. Granted, I learned CAD programs while at Tufts. I learned all the problem solving, um, you know, how to look up uh, 
regulations in any of the manuals. Um, those were all things kind of taken from problem set solving, but um, I, we're thrown into problems that I didn't have any experience in while I was at school, um, undergraduate or graduate. Um, so a lot of it is definitely the, the softer skills versus the, the hard problem set uh, equation type work. I would, um, I would also agree with all those points. Um, a lot of the technologies and things I use at Tufts are, are already obsolete. So it's more like, like you said, <laughs> the problem solving skills and also um, the ability to learn. Um, like in a lot of um, Ming, Ming Chao classes, um, we had to pick up things without books, like learning from the internet, from Stack Overflow, from our peers. Um, I think that was like most important and definitely the skills I use, you know, every day. That's great. I would say too, like when I'm looking, when I'm hiring a new PhD, it's rare that I'm going to um, have a project that's directly related to the work that they did in school. And so it's more, can they explain what they did well? Um, you know, can they learn? Can they think? Can they answer, you know, on the think about answers to questions? Um, so I just want someone that, that can learn, like Lewis said. Yeah, that's a, and Susan, that's a great question. Somebody who's, who's uh, hired and staffed um, teams and, and your own organization is that, you know, in, a, in the current market conditions, you know, what are the, the, the competencies that you desire the most or your organization is looking for the most to, to succeed now and in these new growing endeavors moving forward? Is it to me? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, well, while, um, you know, we definitely would want th them to have an engineering degree and specialize in any area, but it's not just about, you know, continuing down Moore's Law. It's, it's, it's broader than that, as I said. So we're not hire only hiring electrical engineers, but mechanical, chemical, chemists, biologists, um, optical, physicists. So we have a lot of different skills. We, it's good if you can come in with some computer science, machine learning. That's great, too. But like I said, it's more... Um, can you think, can you learn? Because I really said we're, the skills that you have are, we're, we're advancing in technology all the time. So it's not necessarily going to stay stagnant. So you're going to have to continue to learn. I think the biggest things that I found is being able to work in a team collaboratively, communicate your ideas to others, listen, um, be creative. I mean, these are the, this, this is what we're looking for when we're hiring people, or at least in my group, that, that's what I'm looking for. Is there, uh, this again, for all of you, um, is there an underestimated skill that students should be aware of in the business lines that you're in? You know, is it, uh, I was thinking, is a competency, is sustainability, absolutely vital in civil engineering or is coding imperative in entrepreneurship for instance i think i think some of the answers to the previous question do fall into this category as well of being able to describe and talk to your peers about how you're solving a problem um, i i think engineering may, at least in the civil engineering world, there's a lot of kind of the old school way of thinking where it's very singular, there's one right answer, um, and if you can get from point A to point B in a straight line, you're great. But I think especially throwing sustainability into the mix and in the climate, no pun intended, but in the climate that we're living in right now, we have to come up with innovative new ways that we're not the way it was done 10, 15, 30 years ago. Um, so if, if there's um, opportunity to kind of think outside the box and kind of cultivate that as a skill, um, I think employers, especially my employer, really appreciates that. I unfortunately, we do a lot of work with uh, New York City agencies and they have a very strict way of of doing things in their standard detail. So a lot of our innovative opportunities are kind of cut before we even get that opportunity. Um, but we do get private work and 
any of those clients, if we throw something out and they are like, ooh, this is the most effective, cheapest, innovative option, we'll be the first one to implement this and we think it'll work, then they, they'll they come back to us with other projects. Um, so I'd say uh, being able to kind of think outside the box, but within the realm of um, like efficiency and um, being able to produce something that will work versus a very far-fetched idea. Um, again, it's a soft skill. It's not something that you easily learn by reading a book or a textbook or anything, but it's definitely something I, I gained at Tufts. I think the professors there did a good job of pushing um, for, for new ideas, um, but that would be my, my biggest thing, um, and I think my company really appreciates that. So what is the, ro the role of mentorship or mentoring played in your careers? I think for, for a lot of us, it's the autonomy in trying to manifest our own career you know, opportunities, but I think it's hard to be successful in the longer term in a vacuum. And I was sort of interested in your thoughts about, about mentorship that you've received and um, mentorship that, uh, that you've provided. And what would, advice would you give to students trying to seek it out? Um, I, I personally think it's, it's required, like it's, it's required in the workplace because often something you learn in school um, is, I guess, done by the book um, and it's not that way in actual practice. Um, so you need, to, you need to be able to learn from your peers. Like I, um, while I was, uh, you know, working like a trip advisor, I had tons of engineers that, you know, they're principal engineers where they've just been around for, for a long time. Uh, some of them, you know, 30, 40 years, um, they had, you know, great advice and, and um, ways to do things like I would, I would never think of, right? Like it's, it's more of, um, I guess, learning from experience, learning from mistakes and, and mentorship is, is, is a way to, for you to avoid uh, some of those mistakes, but um, it's, it's, it's just a great way to learn and do things, um, I guess, do things the right way the first time. I, I would say if, if anyone has the opportunity to be mentored, they should take it. I've, ha I've had the opportunity um, to be mentored technically by various boss supervisors I've had, but also on a professional and career development level, um, at the CTO was one of my mentors. And it, was, it really um, showed you a different aspect of the company because um, you're always looking at things probably just from your technical, how do you solve this problem? So getting just getting out and being introduced and broadening your um, exposure across the company is always a good thing. And then in turn, I try to, if, if I can mentor, I have, I have new college grads that still work for me. And um, I try to help as much as I can, because I realize how important that was for me to have someone reaching down and helping me. Yeah, I would echo many of those points. Um, I've been mentored by many, many people and I still reach out to them, uh, even if I haven't spoken to them in years. And, and for the most part, they appreciate hearing from me, appreciate hearing how I've used some of their advice to move forward. Um, and I've also mentored some of uh, my younger peers at my company and, and friends of mine. Um, and it's always interesting. It's, it's very much a two-way street. I feel like I learn from them in their situations. When they ask me questions, I then have to think about how, how am I using my abilities to the best that I can and how do I pass that on to the people who I'm mentoring and then you know, I'm then taking those questions and asking them to my mentors and kind of figuring out how to branch between those two. I think having a mentor or having somebody that you can reach out to in your field or not in your field um, is an invaluable resource and definitely take advantage. If there's ever the case, definitely take advantage. So how do you, for all of you, how do you think about planning for the next three to five years of your career. Do you, or is your career planning, how much of your career planning historically and how much moving forward is serendipitous and how much has been intentional? 
I would say the start of my career was serendipitous. I, as I mentioned earlier, I um, majored in chemical engineering. I did research at MIT on energy technology and coal combustion research. Thought I'd work for an oil company, but fortunately they weren't hiring and I ended up in the semiconductor industry and that was probably the best decision I made or, or didn't make, however you want to look at it. So, and, and, then, and, and then just taking opportunities as they come, just taking a new challenge. I, I, there was an opportunity to go to Ireland to work because we have a fab there when they were expanding and I volunteered for it. And that just broadened again, my exposure in the company to see, to meet more people and see different ways of doing things. So um, any, like it's, it's a lot of little decisions along the way, but the first major one wasn't really. <laughs> Yeah, in, I, the, in the podcast, How I Built This, the last question he always asks is that question only. He also asks how much, of, how much of it was hard work and how much of it was luck. So if there's anything in your answer that talks about that, and Susan, obviously, <laughs> you're saying is there was a little luck. Yeah. I, and, and then hard work. Right. Absolutely. I think I followed a similar path where I knew what I wanted to get into, like in, in terms of getting into uh, being a programmer and majoring in computer science and, and getting into industry. But in terms of starting a business and the direction that's um, kind of leading me in is more of uh, where, I guess, where are the problems, like what problems can I solve and where does that bring me? I'm, I'm kind of like a free spirit in that way. If, if someone mentions like a cool problem and Sounds interesting. I'll, I guess I'll just jump on board, but um, uh, yeah, I, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really have a solid uh, path of where I think I will be in, you know, three to five years. Mm -hmm. it's just I, where the where the problems that I can solve, you know, what industries they're in, and you know, it's, it's something I want to work on. Yeah, I would echo that. As uh, I'm still making career decisions now, um, I'm definitely trying to figure out my best path forward using the skills that I have and the interests that I have in trying to combine the two. Um, so right now I, I have civil engineering as my career, my, my day job, and then I have my uh, commitment to sustainability and my involvement with Nessie as kind of a side project. Um, and so I'm still definitely trying to figure out where, where those two intersect. Um, though I would say in terms of um, getting to where I am now, a lot of it has definitely been hard work, but it's also been utilizing the resources and the people I've connected to, um, you know, asking as many questions as I possibly can, because you, you never know what opportunity may pop up. Um, you know, I'm I feel very lucky to be in the position that I am in right now. Um, my company has, has allowed me to do many of the things that I think um, at a different place I might not have been able to take advantage of outside of work. Um, and they have supported me in all of those things. I mean, my, my master's degree, uh, the nitty gritty of it doesn't really translate to the civil engineering work that I'm doing for my company, but they recognize that having that background would potentially broaden their ability to market our team to a wider variety of clients. Um, and so I think having a different kind of side background to um, what my company does in our day to day um, has, has allowed projects to come into our office that maybe we wouldn't have sought out in the first place. Um, so I guess that's the serendipitous side, but it's definitely a lot of hard work um, and, and rolling with the punches if they come. So when do you know when to say yes? I think you know, sort of that serendipity part is that, you know, is it a, is it a function of experience where the yeses come or is it, are there leaps of faith? I think from early you know, phases of our, in our professional lives, I certainly um, in the entrepreneurial space of you know, which clients to take on or types of projects to work on. How do, you, how do you think about when you are going to move forward with something? Um, I mean, I, I think it's definitely a mixture of, it's definitely leaps of faith and um, just from experience, like what to, what to take on. Um, 
And I, th I think it kind of comes down to a general interest. Um, like I've worked in the travel space for a long time and I'm doing something in the fitness space, um, which are two of my general interests. Um, I've had other, um, I guess other projects that come up that I, I didn't really want to get into, um, like the fashion industry. Um, and I mean, it also comes down to, uh, I guess, can you make a living off of what, you know, off of those projects or, or, or you know, what you're working on, right? Because it's, it's, I guess it's not going to be fun if you can't make a living off of that. So you can't help everyone, all right? The other thing I have to think about is it's not always going to, like, you're not going to have 100% confidence in your decision or feel that you're totally qualified or, that you, you know, this is the right thing to do. And sometimes to grow, you ha it has to be uncomfortable <laughs> or it's challenging. And those probably are the best opportunities. So I think one thing that is on every, certainly student's minds right now is, you know, uh, how the pandemic is going, is impacting our markets. And I'd be curious to under, you know, from, from all of your perspectives is how are your organizations um, managing the situation and how do you think the pandemic is going to impact the business in the short term? In terms of the work that my company does, we work very closely with, we're a private company, but we work very closely with many of the public utilities in New York City, um, including uh, Verizon, Comcast. You know, if they're doing street work, we are on site with them doing that work with them. Um, but we also do a lot of work with city agencies, which at the height of the pandemic in New York, they stopped all construction and all design consulting, uh, which threw my company for a loop. Um, and thankfully, we were able to retain enough private work outside of New York um, and enough public work outside of New York to keep all of us busy. Um, again, I feel very lucky to be a part of a team where my boss did his best to make sure everybody was still getting paid. I don't think anybody in my office was laid off or furloughed, um, which is impressive given the fact that we actually lost, I'd say probably 80 or 90% of our work uh, was on pause for a very wow. long time. Um, so, but now now that construction is, is kind of ramping back up in New York City, um, they are then, we're now getting back into our daily routine of things. I, I think in terms of the civil infrastructure world, we do a lot of roadway and highway work. Um, and seeing as how traffic has decreased in the city, there's a lot of opportunity to uh, implement bike lanes and more pedestrian access. And so my company is, is kind of jumping ahead of that and trying to say, we are, we are poised to be the company in New York to do these designs and to do this analysis to make sure that New York City comes back as a more pedestrian and bike friendly city, um, which was pre-pandemic, but is now even more important, um, seeing as how a lot of people are walking more than taking the subway, a lot of people are biking more than taking the subway. Um, so there's that opportunity. Uh, I don't think New York will go back to its peak for a while. Um, a lot of people have left. Um, but the construction and design world is definitely ramping back up uh, and jobs are opening up and, and work is coming in. Um, so it's not as dire as it looked a couple months ago. That's great news. Lewis, how about for you when it comes to sort of thinking about clients and business and how, pro you know, how proactive you have to be to source your business? Yeah, it's it's actually been pretty uh, difficult for uh, for my business because um, I've worked for a lot of uh, companies like in the travel industry, like industries hard hit by by COVID, where they lost you know uh, seventy to ninety percent of their business. Um, so I've kind of had to switch. Um, I kind of switch what I'm doing. Like I um, I'm more. Like I said, I switched over to like the fitness industry because at home fitness is like really hot right now because people are not, you know, people are not going to gyms. Um, people are exercising more like indoor. Um, so I, uh, 
I don't know, I guess, 100% how to answer this because it's like <laughs> something that, yeah, it's just something that kind of came out of nowhere for for everyone. Um, so it's kind of just like learning as I go and um, being, um, uh, to give you more background on this, being in consultant, I was able to, I guess, create enough of a, a savings to handle situations like this mm -hmm. for when uh, businesses, you know, uh, certain uh, you know, client or business dries up, I can then uh, spend more time um, trying to look in other industries. Um, so it's kind of uh, I'm kind of in transition right now, I guess, um, trying to grow my business in other areas. Um, so hopefully, uh, well, hopefully we don't get a second pandemic or something, you know, something like this uh, continues for too long. So I think, you know, for, from a hiring perspective for organizations, I think there's an idea that, you know, organizations hire for skill and for competency, um, you know, and you're interested in an organization. Um, but I think people realizing their personality and who they are is a vital part of how they connect to an organization. You know, how do you think about you know, when you're, when you're looking for talent or looking to, to collaborate with folks or certainly give you advice for, for students, um, how do you recommend, you know, they bring their personality and their individuality to an organization and how can that be successful? Is, is this question for everybody or? Is yeah, please. Yeah, this is for everybody. Um, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I think it's, that's a really hard question, definitely, because it depends not only on your personality, but also on the personality of the company. Um, and those two things definitely have to kind of align in some way. Um, I uh, can call many of my coworkers, some of my closest friends. I've gone camping with them. I've gone on travel trips with them. Uh, we've played on intramural teams together. Um, I think that I, that was something that I was really looking for, and I value that kind of camaraderie. Um, but there are other companies um, where maybe they're more individual, and people have their own lives outside of outside of the work, and it's really just you're in the office or you're working from home these days, and you get the work done, and that's it, and then you each go off into your own lives. Um, so it's it's an interesting question because I think it it really is. Um, kind of a two-way street, right? Like the, the company needs to have the, the same mindset that you have, otherwise some, something along the line, the gears won't line up uh, and there'll be, there'll be issues. Um, but definitely having an open mindset and, and going into an interview or going into a, um, your first week or something, you know, um, kind of being able to role with whatever is thrown at you, um, I think is, is a, a valuable quality to have. And then maybe your more silly side or your more serious side can come out after that. Um, but really putting your best foot forward in the, in the beginning, uh, the initial kind of building of a relationship is, is important. I think you had a great point. Um, and something I want to bring up again is the interview process. Um, I would say remember when you're uh, going on an interview with the company, you're also interviewing the company. Like it's not it's not a one way thing. Um, if you don't feel um, I guess the right energy um, with the people you're interviewing with, or as you you know usually companies would do a walk around. Um, if you if you might stop and talk to a couple of folks, if you don't seem like it's the right place, I would say uh, continue looking. Um, I wouldn't just join the first. Um, I guess company that you you know would go on an interview with if you you know finish the process and see the offer letter. Yeah, I think that's you know, I, you know, the context of you know a conversation like this. I, I think sort of recognizing there's there there's so many different skills and experiences and and, and elements of individuality that come into play, and I think you know, making the point for our students is that there's a, a breadth of experience and interests and styles that come to bear that are part of the roles that we look for. And that, you know, being able to recognize these things and, and how, 
how we build up who we are, I think becomes in, in, incredibly important. Um, if, if you could do it differently, is there anything about your educational experience that you would have changed or done differently? And how, and would it have impacted your, your career? Might have majored in electrical engineering. <laughs> that might have helped, but. Yeah, I can see the benefit <laughs> of that. I think I would also, I mean, just um, done as much hands-on work that I could have, teamwork, uh, those types of projects, getting involved in them, reaching out to professors more. I know that it, it, I, did, I was shy and more of an introvert and didn't do that, but I know now when I am looking for someone, I actually talk to the professors, who do they recommend, who do they know, and that's, that's a lot of, I mean, and that's why they're there to help you. So I would definitely take advantage of everything you can on campus. You know, any support you can get there is, is good. Yeah, I would agree. I think sort of being able to, to think about the, the breadth of your networks um, and how they can impact you and be able to, to be open, sort of open to new options. Um, what advice would you give to students? Oh, actually, I'll take it back. How important do you think is the, your major to your career plan? To be honest, uh, I, like Lewis, chose engineering because there was no language or history requirement, and those are two subjects I'm not, <laughs> not a big fan of. Um, but the, the problem-solving aspect of it was something that I really, really enjoyed, and I think it, it probably could have been any of the, the more like direct tracks. Um, but I opted while I was at Tufts undergrad to kind of choose classes based on what sounded really interesting versus having a direct, like, this is the geotech track or this is the structural track. I kind of picked and chose classes um, as long as I had the prerequisites for it. Um, and I do think that that's uh, kind of dictated a little bit of my professional path as well, um, where I work for a company that does appreciate that I have all of these different interests and I can go to my project manager and say, hey, you know, I'd love to work on this project, this type of project. Uh, and to the, you know, the principal of the company will then look for those types of projects. And it, it gives me the opportunity to kind of dictate a direction. Um, I think my civil engineering background from Tufts uh, has definitely come into play but not, it hasn't dictated the entire path of my career. Um, and in many ways, it's only, it, it was the first set of rungs on the ladder, but I'm still building the next ones that I'm moving up to. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a solid foundation. And I think that's what's really important. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm still trying to figure this stuff out too. I mean, I, I feel like I could have been a, a participant in asking these questions. Um, and it's, it's great to hear what Lewis and Susan have to say about these as well. How important was graduate school for you in your, in your plan in your future? Uh, it was definitely, you know, I graduated and was kind of done. I didn't want to be in classrooms anymore. I wanted to be thrown into situations and, and learn while I was working. Um, and then I got to the point where I kind of hit a wall of um, the types of projects I was working on. And so my company supported me going back and getting a master's degree. Um, I was able to do it while working full time. I did part time classes. Um, and now I can take some of that information that I learned in my master's back to my company and say, hey, I want to work on these types of projects. How do we get more of that kind of sustainability minded work? Um, so in terms of it being important, it definitely helped grow my background. Um, I don't think that it was necessary for where I am right now. Um, but the network that I was able to cultivate with that program is definitely something that I utilize more than some of the, the class knowledge that I learned. 
Um, so I think that's where the Masters comes in handy for sure. So Matt, we I, I offered to the um, to the way to the room their ability to take questions, but we're sort of running out of time for that. Can we just make sure that no one has a burning question for our panelists? Anyone have a, pa a, a question? You can certainly type it or at this point, you could probably even raise your hand and we'll get to you. If not, Matt and I are gonna keep asking questions. <laughs> There was one specific question that had come out and maybe difficult to address, but you know, students are wondering um, how significant is the, the, how significant given the pandemic, has it decreased the ability to negotiate with organizations for new jobs and for new salaries and for new benefits? I would say um, it has just because the sheer number of people that are on the market. Because, um, I mean, companies that I worked for um, or worked with have, have laid off uh, some of them 40%. I mean, more like 20, 20, 25% of their uh, workforce. And um, these are pretty strong uh, technical, you know, technical folks um, that are also looking so I, I would I'd assume it's going to be harder for someone straight out of uh, college to, to find something. I actually I guess you mean, yeah, because we haven't really entered the I mean from a new college grad perspective we're just coming into that recruiting season so we'll have to see what what it brings but uh, I mean analog strong it hasn't impacted us mm. and this could be because we're different. We're an established company. And like I said, we, we just even, um, and it was totally done virtually. We acquired a large company and, you know, a third of our size in during this. So um, I know that we are hiring new college grads next year and we'll have to see how competitive we have to be with it. Yeah. And I, I think it's important for, for, for us to realize is that, it's not, you know, it's not a peanut butter approach to, to breakdowns in the marketplace. To your point, Susan, is that there are plenty of sectors and industries that are, that are growing and exploding or, or maintaining themselves. Yeah. Um, so, you know, thinking about, you know, where Lewis had worked for, for in the travel industry, which has seen a, a massive disruption where TripAdvisor has laid off, you know, a, a significant chunk and, and closed an office in downtown Boston. Uh, so I think for students recognizing is that when you are thinking about your options moving forward, you know, thinking about industries and thinking about markets and talking to people about what is growing and what's sustained, you know, and how to think about leveraging your skills in different ways that may be applied to different industries, um, I think can be pretty valuable. I think we also like one of the topics about COVID-19 and, and um, you know how that can impact industry and going there, there's a lot of opportunities there that this pandemic is presenting and, and not only on the technical technological innovations that are needed to directly um you know related to the diagnosis detection prevention treatment and eradication of the disease but you know to to other things that are you know our daily lives and how do we i mean there's a lot of innovation that can be applied there and even like complex programs to do contact tracing, or they can be simple everyday solutions like, you know, the foot pedals or, or, or voice activation to open doors. And I think that there's a lot of technologies and companies that have thrived during this pandemic, um, Zoom, Instacart, um, and there's other things that we're going to need going forward, like how do you order at restaurants with apps and um, Autonomous Uber drivers, telehealth is really big. I mean, I, mm. how many people have had doctor's appointments um, since the pandemic? Some things are hard. I, I haven't had the dental, you know, but <laughs> definitely there's opportunities out there that this is presenting and illuminating and how our world is going to change going forward. Um, so, and then, and just how we do our job too. Like I said, Zoom's big. Um, I think we need some electronic whiteboard situation that's, that's, that's good. We need innovation in the classrooms at universities. So I think there's a lot of opportunities 
Um, so maybe some of the as industries like, you know, travel, cruise ships, and stuff, you know, but I think they're, that, that going forward, you're just going to have to be more adaptable and thinking differently and, and opportunities are going to be there, I think. Anyway, long answer. <laughs> There's, I mean, there's always also the option, as you said, to be innovative and create new products and new, you know, new companies, new services. Um, it's, it's harder, but it's, it could be done. If, if you were asked, you guys, what would you have had us ask you so you can answer them? Um, what what didn't we ask you that you wish we had, which is my favorite interview question. So now I can ask you. If I was interviewing you, you'd have to answer. So you may as well tell me. <laughs> I, I guess uh, you, you kind of asked it, but I, I can't um, emphasize enough how important communication and interpersonal skills are um it's it's so valuable and and you could, because in your career you're going to not just be talking to your peers but teams are multidisciplinary and you're going to have to be talking to people that might not understand so you're going to have to figure out a way to explain the most complicated thing in the simplest of terms or you could be talking to the a higher level and the same thing could apply um so th those that's the biggest thing that i've learned in in my career is how important that is to be talking at the right level to make sure you're bringing everyone along because if you're having a meeting and everyone's not there um you know you're there's no point in having the meeting because you, you want people's input and and the value of of different perspectives on things it's it's amazing it, you rarely find where one person has all the answers well some people think they do but no <laughs> <laughs> I think a question that I may have asked and and I personally don't really know the answer to um, but is in in this day of remote meetings and and uh, you know zoom conversations what is the interviewing process like really like you know how how to prepare for a zoom interview how to prepare for starting a job remotely where you're you're not even going into an office um, I think th those are questions that um, you know, I'm somewhat in the process of kind of seeing what other opportunities are out there, and um, you know, the the prospect of interviewing and then starting a job without even going into an office and seeing kind of how that office works um, is daunting in some ways. I mean, uh, I think for me, a lot of uh, choosing a position, and this goes back to an earlier question, choosing a position definitely does depend on kind of the way the vibe of an office space and not being able to have that kind of contact directly with the space you'd be working in, I think um, definitely is, a, is an interesting uh, pandemic related <laughs> side effect. Susanna just wrote in to say that we do have a virtual interviewing presentation on our YouTube channel. So if you want that, Mira, you can go find it and the rest of you on the call can also do that. Great. Sorry, Lewis, it's your turn to answer the question or ask the question you wish I had asked you. <laughs> um, I, I would say, are you a self-starter? Like, can you, um, can you find the right, you know, can you find the stakeholders involved with the problem? Can you communicate? Like, can you, can you get the uh, problem started and, you know, across the finish line? Um, I, I would say that's, that's a pretty uh, big thing in general, uh, just because there's a lot of starters, there's not a lot of finishers. Like I've, I've seen this, uh, I guess, just in life in general. Um, that's it. That is the funniest ending point, is that there are a lot of starters and not a lot of finishers, but we have to finish. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you have any last things? No, I think this is this has been brilliant. I think we've, I think you know, from a career services standpoint, you know, we're trying to help our students understand career planning as a process, and that everybody falls along that along that continuum. And you know, we've addressed questions around exploration. We've addressed questions 
around targeting opportunities and in industries. We've talked about, you know, looking for jobs and job success and interview prep, you know, and I think there's a lot of, a, a lot of sage advice here. And uh, we're incredibly grateful for, uh, for you, Susan and, and Mira and, and Lewis for sharing your time and your insights today. Um, I think it's been incredible for our students and uh, we're grateful for it. So thanks so much. Thank you Thank so you. much. And it, it will now be, because it was recorded, other students will get to see it as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Yes.